The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Molly Alawade, and I'm the Director of Education here at the American Kidney Fund. Without further ado, allow me to introduce today's speakers, Dr. Ken Sutha and Bailey Park. Dr. Sutha was diagnosed with nephrotic syndrome and focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, or FSGS, at the age of 10. He was able to manage his symptoms with medicines and keep his kidney disease under control throughout most of his childhood. Due to declining kidney function, he received a preemptive living kidney donation from his father and he, while, when he was in medical school, and he avoided the need for dialysis. Today, Dr. Sutha is a pediatric nephrologist and lab researcher at Stanford University. A passionate advocacy and ambassador for AKF, Dr. Sutha has met with congressional offices to advocate for protections for living organ donors and has spoken at AKF's Kidney Action Day in San Jose, underscoring the importance of prevention and early detection of kidney disease. At the 2019 Hope Affair Gala, Dr. Sutha was honored with the Hero of Hope Award for the work he does to build a stronger tomorrow by seeking ways to improve the lives of the young kidney patients he treats. Bailey Park is a sophomore at Frederick Community College, majoring in library sciences. She was born with multicystic dysplastic kidney disease. Bailey received her kidney transplant in 2011 at the age of 10. Thank you, Dr. Sutha and Bailey for joining us today. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you. So first, So first, let's get into Dr. Sutha's story. So Dr. Sutha, can you tell us in your own words what FSGS is and how it affects the kidneys? Sure, uh, as you mentioned, FSGS stands for focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. That's a lot of big words. Uh, but basically what that means is that there's scarring of the filtering part of the kidney. Uh, this scarring uh, and damage leads to leakage of protein and then, if not controlled over the course of uh, time, usually many years, uh, that, that leakage of protein then goes on to cause more scarring and damage, eventually uh, leading the kidneys to fail. So what was it like growing up with kidney disease? Do you, did you ever feel like you were able to do all the things that you wanted to do as a kid or as a young adult? Yeah, um, it was definitely difficult at times, uh, particularly right after I, I was diagnosed. Uh, there was a lot of time away from school and friends because of doctor's appointments, blood work, uh, and I had side effects from medications like weight gain and uh, moodiness from prednisone. Um, but after uh, that initial diagnosis period and once things settled down and my kidney function stabilized for a bit, uh, I was able to pretty much do most things that everybody else was able to do uh, and that I wanted to do. Um, I went off to college and even went to medical school. Um, and I was involved in all kinds of activities during school, like theater and singing, and I had time to travel and all kinds of things like that. Wonderful. And so um, when did you start thinking about a kidney transplant? Sure. Um, I had first uh, heard from my, my doctor when uh, I was a teenager. They uh, told me and my parents that uh, a transplant was sometime in my future. Uh, but really at that time, uh, it was difficult for me to understand because it was something far off in the future and, and, and not very concrete. Uh, it wasn't really until I was in college that my kidney function was starting to deteriorate more and um, I was starting to have more side effects of uh, chronic kidney disease and require more medications that it really became real and it started to be something that was in my immediate future. Uh, at that point though, it was still a couple of years away, um, but that ended up being good because it gave me time to kind of prepare mentally and to, to think about uh, what the process was going to be like. Uh, and that, I mean, really that's the best way that it should be because you don't want to be caught off guard and be surprised when it's time, uh, when the time comes that you need a transplant. Absolutely. So speaking of being prepared, what were some of the first things you did to prepare for a kidney transplant? Sure. Um, uh, so I was already starting to go see the doctor a lot more frequently uh, because I was having more symptoms from my chronic kidney disease. Um, and uh, I was needing to take a lot more medications. And so that ended up being good preparation for uh, after transplant because I had to be more responsible about managing my medications, managing my doctor's appointments, and uh, getting my blood work done on time and all, all kinds of things like that. Um, the next big thing that I did was really to seek out a community. Uh, growing up as a kid with kidney disease, and even when I was a young adult, I really didn't know anybody else 
uh, around my age that was that had kidney disease. And even though I had my parents and, and my doctor to talk to, uh, I didn't have anybody that uh, knew really what the experience was like uh, having kidney disease. Uh, so for me, at least, it was really important to have others to talk to and to, to have a community. Um, so to do that, I became a part of this mentor program that matched people like me that were waiting for a transplant with people who had already gone through the process, um, both the evaluation process and then what life was like after transplant. Uh, I was able to reach out to various online communities and ask uh, questions of other people that had gone through it. And uh, another thing I did is I started volunteering with organizations that uh, did work uh, around kidneys and organ transplantation. Uh, and that really gave me a, a great opportunity to meet other people who were similar to me uh, while also giving back to my community. That's wonderful. Um, so how did your life change after kidney transplant? Yeah, uh, so it's it's important to remember, I think, first that transplant is a treatment and not a cure for kidney disease. Uh, it comes with definitely with its own sets of challenges and 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 roadblocks and difficulties, uh, and and it still requires it's a lifelong treatment that requires lifelong medication. Uh, that said, I think that the pros and far outweigh the cons in terms of quality of life uh, and freedom that it affords you uh, compared to dialysis. Um, before my transplant, uh, I definitely felt like uh, I had a lot less energy and I was getting tired a lot, I was sleepy, uh, food just didn't taste great to me and I felt nauseated. Um, and I mean, at the time that was just life for me and I, I didn't know any different, uh, but it wasn't really until after my transplant that I, I realized just how sick I, sick I was. Uh, the immediate time right after transplant was definitely an adjustment, uh, just because there's so many medications you have to take and uh, you have to make sure that you're drinking enough water and um, even like the foods that you're eating are totally different because they're before transplant when you have chronic kidney disease, your, desi your diet is really restricted and there are a lot of things you can't eat. Uh, but after transplant, you're supposed to eat those things like all the time. Um, and there was also adjustment to the, the frequent blood draws and doctor's appointments uh, right after transplant multiple times a week. Um, but over time, those uh, decreased and things settled down and I definitely had a bunch more energy and was able to do all kinds of things uh, that I never imagined that I could do. Uh, I was never really very athletic before transplant, um, but uh, I was able to start exercising afterwards and that was something that was new to me. That's great. So speaking of exercise, um, what do you do to stay healthy now? Yeah, uh, so like I mentioned, I, I like to exercise regularly. So many of the medications that are needed for transplant and uh, to prevent rejection, uh, like tacrolimus and prednisone, uh, also increase the risk for different diseases like uh, weight gain, uh, obesity, diabetes, and high blood pressure. These are all things that can potentially harm the kidney and that, that are, are damaging to the kidney. And in the long term, uh, and commonly, these are actually um, very uh, leading causes of kidney failure in adults. Uh, so in order to protect my transplant, to keep, to keep it healthy, I wanted to offset these by um, eating healthy and exercising. Uh, I started swimming, biking, doing yoga, and all the other kinds of exercises. And I was even able to, trans to participate in something called the Transplant Games, which are an Olympic-style competition for people with transplants, um, where I actually won gold medals. Um, yeah. Um, I started doing, uh, I did a triathlon and a half marathon and all things that I never imagined possible. Um, the healthy diet is still a little bit of a challenge because <laughs> I like desserts and sweets a lot. Um, but, you know, uh, it's, it's still difficult. But something that I know is important. Uh, another thing that's important for to stay healthy is making sure to take care of uh, your skin uh, from damage to the sun because um, as transplant patients uh, and even patients with chronic kidney disease, we have an increased risk of cancer, including skin cancer. And so it's super important to wear sunscreen. That's, yeah, that's an important point. So what are some special considerations that a person with FSGS should be aware of post-kidney transplant? Yeah, so uh, this definitely doesn't happen to everybody, but in some people with FSGS, uh, the disease can actually recur after transplant uh, and damage the transplanted kidney. And this can be a very serious problem that can sometimes lead to losing the transplanted kidney. Um, again, uh, this doesn't happen to many people, but it's definitely something that doctors have to look out for and, and monitor for after transplant. That's good to know. Um, what is something you wish everyone knew or understood about kidney disease? Um, for the general public, um, I think that it's important that they know that it's extremely common. 
uh, most people don't feel the effects of it, and it's a it's a um, uh, a silent disease um, because they don't have any ill effects of it until it's too late for them to do anything about it. Uh, uh, along those lines, it's it's also an, an invisible disease, and so uh, there aren't very outwards any many outward signs or symptoms. Uh, so it's difficult for other people to know that you what you're struggling with and what you're dealing with uh, when you have kidney disease. Uh, on the flip side of that, uh, when you even after you've been diagnosed with kidney disease, you oftentimes don't feel the effects uh, that it's having on your bones and on your your blood pressure and, and other things like that, um, and on your your blood cells. And so uh, it can be difficult to to know exactly why you're taking all these medications that you have to take for your for your, your kidney disease. But even that, though that's the case, it's still important to take them. Uh, the last thing is that uh, there is no real cure for chronic kidney disease. And really, the most effective thing that we have to, to do is uh, is to prevent it from getting worse and to preserve uh, kidney function. Uh, and so, uh, this applies also for patients with transplants too. So, like I was talking about, leaving living a healthy lifestyle to try to prevent uh, those different kinds of diseases that can impact kidney function uh, are really important. That's good advice. So, Dr. Sutha, I know you're an active AKF ambassador, and you even participated in our advocacy day on Capitol Hill earlier this year. So, how do you feel that being an advocate has empowered you and empowered others with kidney disease? Uh, it's definitely empowered me a lot. Uh, I, I think that as patients, we're really the experts about our, our own kidney disease um, because we're living it as part of our, our day to day life. Uh, and as experts, others want to hear and learn from us. And so I think it's really empowering for me and for other patients to be able to uh, share our stories and to, to talk to people about what it means to have kidney disease. Uh, also, it's been really great to meet other advocates, uh, to, to hear their stories uh, and to become friends with them. Great. Um, so what advice would you give to people with kidney disease who are interested in becoming advocates? Yeah, a great place, is to, a great place to start is to start in your own community, uh, like with your, in your school or uh, your church or uh, with your friends even, uh, by sharing your experience and, and telling them about your story. Uh, the people around you want to know your story, want to know what you've been through. Uh, and I think by having that personal connection uh, to you, uh, they'll really take that message to heart. Um, and you can, you can really educate them about what kidney disease is uh, so that they know its importance, uh, so that they can know what to do to find out if they have it uh, or what they can do to prevent it. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sutha, for sharing your story with us. We really appreciate it. So now I'm going to turn over the mic to Bailey and ask you some of the same questions. So Bailey, can you tell us, well, actually, first I'm going to start with Dr. Sutha again. Dr. Sutha, can you tell us a little bit about multicystic dysplastic kidney disease, which was the original diagnosis that Bailey received? Right. So uh, basically what that means is that uh, the kidneys, for some reason, uh, didn't grow normally during development. Um, and uh, sometimes patients with multicystic plastic kidney disease have a little bit of kidney function uh, and so are able to go for a couple of years before needing a transplant. Um, but eventually, uh, because of uh, their kidneys aren't able to keep up with them as they grow bigger uh, through childhood and into adolescence, uh, they end up needing to uh, get a transplant. Good to know. So Bailey, what was it like growing up with kidney disease? Um, and do you feel you were able to do things that you wanted to do as a kid and now as a young adult? Well, growing up with kidney disease was normal for me. It was normal to be cat and to take 12, up to 12 medicines twice a day and drink them out of water and go to my checkups and go to my labs. Um, every month and I feel like I was able to do things I wanted to do um, like horseback riding, tennis, reading books, but as I grew older I realized the gravity of my disease and yeah. Great, so I know you're in college now, so how do you manage kidney disease while juggling classes and exams and extracurriculars and making time to see friends and just all the things that college students do? Well, it very much is a juggling act. I usually keep multiple alarms on my phone and a water tracker and, 
email my uh, keep track of my labs on my chart and talking to my uh, doctors on my chart as well. Good, good. So um, what impact has multicystic dysplastic kidney disease had on your parents or your siblings? I feel that's made my siblings more empathic and uh, given us a greater strength as a family. And um, it's impacted us in the way that we're very much advocate about kidney transplants and kidney disease and other diseases. Um, my so brother be, wants to become a uh, pediatric doctor because of my disease. Wow, that's incredible. Um, so speaking of transplant, when did you first start thinking about a kidney transplant? Um, well, my mom started thinking of a kidney transplant when I was four, but I started thinking about it um, when there was a possibility of getting one. Uh, my donor was in Baltimore and we met her um, after my kidney transplant, three days after. And um, it was really cool to be able to meet the person that gave me my kidney. And um, it was sort of a rush yeah. to get it done. Yeah. So what were some of the first things you did to prepare for a kidney transplant? Well, me and my family first celebrated by going watch. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, just a lot of mental preparing, uh, my medications, getting labs, talking to my doctors, uh, just learning what I had to do after my kidney transplant, like staying inside for three months and wearing masks and um, washing my hands constantly. Yeah, that's important. Um, so, and those are some of the things that you have to do to stay healthy. So in addition to those things, what else do you do to stay healthy now? Um, I usually run a mile every day and I make sure that I have the protein like eggs and chicken and um, eating salads and making sure not to have many sweets, even though it's really hard because sweets are good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I don't drink sodas. Okay. Um, so what is something you wish everyone knew or understood about kidney disease? Um, I wish that people would understand that kidney disease is, uh, doesn't define someone. It's just another part of their life. And it's another step that we have to take every single day. And it is hard to do, but we are people and we want to enjoy life to the fullest. And um, that uh, we uh, have feelings and we're not just another kidney that um, to be looked at. Mm -hmm. So um, would you consider yourself an advocate for kidney disease? Yes, I very much do. Great. So um, how do you feel that being an advocate has empowered you and others with kidney disease? Um, well, I actually last week went to speak to Johns Hopkins medical students on the effects of kidney disease and uh, how to treat patients with kidney disease. And I've also spoke at churches and I go to Camp All Stars, which is a camp for people with kidney disease. And I feel, and I also have friends that have kidney disease. Um, and it's really empowering to be able to talk to people about it and um, have a community surrounding you. That's wonderful. Well, Bailey, thank you so much for sharing your story. We really appreciate it. So in our next part of our webinar, we're going to get into some resources that Dr. Sutha has uh, put together for us. So Dr. Sutha, can you walk us through some of these uh, materials? So first, yeah, uh, first is... Uh, uh, Johns Hopkins has a camp for uh, children uh, annually over the summer uh, called Camp All Stars, which uh, you've been to and are a counselor at Bailey. Um, for those that don't live in the uh, Baltimore area, the American Association of Kidney Patients has put together a great resource of a uh, list of camps around the country for patients with kidney disease or with transplants. Uh, and so you can look to see what uh, camps are around in your area. I know that I have, uh, like I mentioned, I've done some 
uh, work at different camps, uh, Georgia and working at camps out in California now. And it's, it's great. And I, I super, super recommend that everybody go and check out these camps. Um, there's also a uh, cyber support group uh, called NEF Kids, uh, where you can connect with other uh, patients that uh, have kidney disease. Uh, and there's also the Renal Support Network, uh, which um, puts on the Renal Teen Prom. Uh, lastly, uh, the American uh, Society of Transplantation has a great uh, compilation of different resources. Uh, in particular, a uh, guide about pediatric kidney transplantation that's uh, very, very comprehensive and goes into answering a lot of questions both about the process leading up to transplant and what life is like after transplant and different kinds of considerations about uh, barriers and uh, problems that might come up after transplant. Uh, that's very, very useful that I recommend uh, that everybody take a look at. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing those. So now we're gonna jump into the questions part of our webinar. So, um, so we've got some audience questions that we received. So um, firstly, or actually these are the questions, Bailey, that came from the camp. So Bailey, would you like to ask some of these questions of Dr. Sutha? Yes, so my peers have submitted some, some questions for the first one is, is it true that most people who get a kidney transplant as a teen will need a second transplant? Hmm. Yeah, so uh, this is possibly changing as new, uh, better treatments uh, for rejection are developed and transplants are able to last longer. Uh, but currently it is likely that many with a transplant as a kid or as a teenager uh, will need a second transplant over their lifetime. There's a big variability in how long transplants will last but on average, it's usually somewhere around 10 to 15 years. Since that's just an average, that means that there are a lot of people that have kidneys that last a lot longer than that. Uh, so for example, I know people that have had their kidneys for like 20 or 30 years or more. Um, however, hopefully teenagers are going to be, uh, that have had a kidney transplant are gonna live a lot longer than just 20 or 30 years. So uh, if with the way that things are right now with transplants, uh, it's likely that uh, they would need a second or a third transplant. But rest assured, there are many people that are working on ways to change and improve this through research. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll be able to improve this. Great. The second question is, how can teens keep up their hopes and not feel discouraged if they, ended up, if they end up needing a second transplant? Yeah. Uh, so this is a very difficult question, but a very important one. Uh, sometimes this can happen due to things that are out of control, out of our control, like infections or complications, um, or sometimes it can be things that you might have done, like not taking your medicine. I lost my first transplant after my, uh, from my dad after about a decade due to complications from infections and then eventually rejection. Um, either way, no matter how it is that uh, you end up losing your transplant and needing a second one, uh, there can be a lot of guilt and discouragement that comes with that, uh, especially while you're waiting for another transplant, because oftentimes it does take a lot longer to get a second transplant. It's a lot more difficult. Um, it's important to acknowledge these feelings, and, but not to dwell on them uh, so that you can move forward uh, and then also learn from the mistakes uh, that, that might have happened the first time around. Uh, it's also important that you find somebody that you're comfortable talking with about these different feelings, uh, whether it's your parents, your siblings, friends, doctors, or, or even a therapist. Um, yeah. Definitely. So the third question is, I go to school and I'm always busy with activities and friends. What type of dialysis would suit people who are living my lifestyle? Well, uh, unfortunately, dialysis is going to take a lot of your time, no matter what, and there's really no way around it because you need it to live. Um, and, and that really sucks, but it's something that we have to deal with, uh, with as people with kidney disease, uh, as kidney patients. Uh, so really, we just have to make it work with what we have available to us. Um, the ultimate decision is of what kind of dialysis is gonna be right for you is gonna be very individual and is best made with discussion between you and your, uh, um, your parents and your doctors. Uh, but for me, when I was in the situation when I had to go on to dialysis after my first transplant, um, I decided that peritoneal dialysis was best for me. It's a type of dialysis that can be done at night for many hours while you sleep. Uh, it's definitely not the right solution and the right form of dialysis for everyone. Um, 
And for some people, it might be better to do in-center hemodialysis or, or home hemodialysis or what uh, something like that. Um, but for me, it gave me a lot more flexibility, uh, most flexibility to turn my own schedule uh, and being able to remain busy and active. Great. So the fourth question is, what kinds of sports can I play and what can I not play, specifically cheerleading? So in general, we recommend non-contact sports uh, because those are preferred, things like running, swimming, uh, even soccer. Uh, whereas contact sports like football, karate, kickboxing, and hockey, and even some, some things like trampoline, sledding, and skiing that have a higher risk of injury, uh, those things should be avoided if possible. Cheerleading is probably okay without aerial work. Um, that said, uh, I usually tell my patients uh, that, we, that they got their transplant uh, because we wanted them to live a normal life, uh, not to live in a bubble. Everything that we do, no matter what, walking out in the street even, uh, it comes with a risk. And it's up to you and your team to, to, to balance those, those, those risks uh, and to make a dis decision for yourself about what's too much risk for your kidney and for your health. If there's something that you're absolutely passionate about doing uh, that you couldn't live without doing, uh, you might still be able to do it, uh, though you might have to do some modifications or wear some sort of a pre protective equipment. Uh, for example, there are professional athletes with transplants, uh, NBA players, uh, even an Olympic snowboarder. Wow. What about tubes and piercings allowed with kidney disease? Again, like I said, everything comes with a risk. Um, in general, our answer is no, uh, because there's a, there's a risk of infection uh, from possible uh, non-sterile equipment and needles that are used uh, in tattoos and piercings. However, as tattoos are increasingly more mainstream and the concern for infections has decreased, uh, we still tell everybody no, but we understand that sometimes people will go ahead and get them anyways. So for those people, uh, if you're old enough to make this decision to, to do it and you decide that uh, you're dead set on getting it despite us saying that we don't recommend that you do it, uh, it's important that you choose a reputable, well-established business uh, with good hygiene and sterilization practices. Um, I would recommend that you insist that the uh, tattoo artist or piercing person uh, opens up the sterile packaging in front of you so that you know that it's sterile and clean. Afterwards, you should also pay particular attention to the area, uh, particularly if you have piercing, because that might be a site for increased risk of infection. And as you know, um, patients with transplants and also even with kidney disease are at increased risk for infection. Very much so. Um, another question is, can I drink alcohol once I'm of legal age? It is okay to drink uh, in moderation, usually about uh, one to two drinks occasionally uh, after transplant, if it's legal for you to do so. Um, uh, the, the concern is, uh, for those with, kidney, uh, with a kidney transplant or with chronic kidney disease, uh, is that drinking uh, can lead to dehydration, particularly with excessive or binge, binge drinking, uh, and dehydration is harmful to the kidneys. Uh, alcohol can sometimes cause an unsafe drop in your blood pressure, uh, which again is also harmful for your kidneys. And there might be interactions with alcohol and some of your medications that make it more likely for that to happen. Again, uh, I would recommend talking with your doctor about your specific situation about all these things. Definitely. Um, and our final question is, will I be able to have kids with kidney disease? Yeah, uh, so the answer is most likely, most likely yes. Uh, sometimes due to kidney disease or medications that you have to take uh, for your kidney disease or transplant, uh, you can have decreased fertility uh, for both men and women, uh, making it more difficult but not impossible to conceive a baby. Um, importantly, though, it, you should know that despite this decreased fertility, unprotected sex can still lead to an unplanned pregnancy at any time. And that's not even, not, not even to mention STDs, the risk of STDs, which are, uh, would be more serious in the transplant patient. Um, so it's important that when you're having sex that you always use a protection, uh, such as a condom, uh, until you know that you're ready to have a child. Uh, you should remember that it only takes one egg and one sperm to, to make a baby. Once you're ready to have children, you should also make sure to talk about the decision with your transplant doctor, because certain medications can harm uh, the developing fetus. And also, uh, pregnancy can also uh, worsen certain uh, Certain kidney uh, disease, certain kidney function, and uh, kidney disease. Thank you so much, Dr. Suda. That's all we have for today. 
Well, thank you, Bailey and Dr. Suva, um, and thank you to all the teens who submitted those questions. So next, I want to get into advice. Um, I want to I want to ask you um, some advice questions uh, for young teens. So really, advice you would have given your younger self. Um, so Dr. Sutha, we'll start with you. If you could go back in time, what advice would you have given to your younger self? Yeah, um, I would probably would have told myself that it's not going to be an easy road and that there's going to be a lot of roadblocks and setbacks that are going to come along, um, but that you're stronger than you know that you are and that you can overcome these things and you have a great future ahead of yourself. And Bailey, what about you? Um, I would say to my younger self that um, you need to keep up with your medications and learn them by heart, but you also need to learn how to not dwell on the fact that you have a kidney disease and find your niche, find uh, your favorite book, find your favorite activity to do with your friends, and don't let um, it drag you down. That's wonderful advice. Um, back to Dr. Sutha. Um, what would you want all teenagers managing kidney disease to know? Uh, I would definitely want them to know that they're not alone in this. Uh, your family and your friends are there for you, your doctors, uh, the rest of the, the transplant team uh, and the, the nephrology team, if you haven't had a transplant yet. Uh, there are lots of other people out there that are going through similar challenges. Uh, so I think uh, if you're able to, you should try to attend uh, a kidney or transplant camp, at like one of those, res one of those uh, at that resource that we uh, linked to. Um, you should try, if you can, go to, the, go to compete at the transplant games become or become a part of an online kidney community or volunteer with the local kidney organization. I think um, meeting other people who are like you that are dealing with uh, things that are similar to you is, is really invaluable. Great. And Bailey, what would you want all teenagers managing kidney disease to know? That you are going through a tough time and it is a hard road, but um, you'll be able to manage it uh, having a support group and talking to your parents when it gets tough and talking to your friends when it gets tough and also your doctors. Um, you are able to get through it and we'll get through it. Uh, Dr. Sutha, one more question for you. So from a doctor's perspective, what concerns do you hear most commonly from teens and how would you address them? Yeah, so similar to what we, uh, we got from the questions from Bailey, some of the hot topics uh, include drinking and drugs and, and what to do when you're around friends that are doing those things, um, having children, um, making the transition of going off to college, transitioning from pediatric to adult care, uh, and things that go along with that, like insurance. Those are all, all, all super important. Um, usually I, I tell them, you know, it's, it's difficult transitioning from high school to college and being independent as, uh, for any teenager, really. Uh, let alone having this added burden of having a kidney transplant. Um, there's, as a teenager, there's constantly pressure to fit in and to be like everyone else, and it's um, it's tough. Um, but I really recommend the best ways to to start talking about these things and thinking about them uh, uh, well ahead of time, and to raise these concerns uh, with your parents and uh, with your doctor, uh, so that you can uh, talk about these things early and that you can come up with ideas and strategies about how you can build your life and uh, your kidney transplant health around one another so that they don't have to be competing uh, and so that you're able to figure out what, what kind of regimen, what kind of um, balance of things works out best for you. Like I said before, uh, we want you to, you got to transplant so that you can live your life. Uh, we, it's, it's something that you have to deal with, um, but we want you, we want it to be integrated with your life. Wonderful. Um, and Bailey, one last question for you. As a teenager, what do you wish more adults understood about kidney disease? And adults could include doctors, parents, teachers, or coaches. Um, well, for parents, I would want them to understand that your teen is going through a lot, including what a normal teen goes through, but also kidney disease added with it. So I would check on your kids like you probably always do. <laughs> <laughs> and um, just make sure they're okay for teachers um, if like the kid is uh, missing for a couple of days because they have to go in for a medical appointment to be nice to them about it. Um, coaches if they have to sit out because they had a biopsy 
um, don't like take it too hard that they're not participating because they are dealing with a life of Absolutely. Great advice. Thank you to the two of you. So thank you to Dr. Supa and to Bailey. And this concludes today's webinar. Thank you all for joining and we hope to see you again.